Hello, everyone. It's Lynn Hunsaker here. So glad to talk with you today about a very important topic, building on what we talked about last week, ease of work. Today, we're talking about ease of business, not to be confused with easy, snap your fingers and everything is done for you as a customer. I don't think customers really expect that, but it really is about expectations. Uh, when a customer's reality, meaning their perceptions, as well as what they actually saw, heard, felt, uh, tasted, smelled, all of those senses combined with perceptions, whenever that reality is less than their expectations, they look at it as a poor experience. For example, whenever they're worrying about something, there's uncertainty, uh, maybe what they read or what they heard in your value proposition, your marketing, your, your sales, your service uh, communications, isn't quite panning out, uh, there's a delay or something, uh, that's worry and that's not ease of business. Uh, whenever there's a cost that's unexpected, it could be money, it could be resources, it could be opportunities, that's not ease of the business. Whenever there are delays, uh, that's an example of uh, you know putting an extra burden on customers, that's not ease of business. And finally, uh, hassles of any type, jumping through hoops, having to call a different number, uh, uh, all uh, many different types of things. So what I'd like to invite you to do right now is let us know where you're calling from, where, where you're located today. It's always interesting to see where our participants are around the world. And at the same time, uh, please give an example of ease of business, good or bad. And I'll be glad to comment or answer any questions that you have during our uh, brief session this morning. So we know what ease of business is not, but when a customer's reality matches their expectations, they look at it as a good experience. And that is really what I mean by customer experience excellence or ease of business, almost identical to to me, I, I, I think we could have a really interesting conversation about uh, whether there's uh, any, uh, that's a full overlap or any uh, modifications, but just quite simply, what we're talking about is closing the gap between what is promised and what's delivered. We're closing the gap between customers' realities and their expectations. And the more proactive we can do that, the better off we'll be in morale, reputation, costs, organic growth of all types. Uh, we don't really want to cause worry, costs, delays, and hassles, and then just fix those things and put the whole onus on customer service, for example, for a first contact resolution. That's great, but how about uh, resolving or preventing these things from the get-go in the way that we manage our business? Glad to see you, Suzanne. Uh, we're missing you, Joanne. Glad to see your comments there. Keep them coming. So, you know, I think it's helpful to look at the opposite of ease of business to get a clear idea of what we're talking about. Negative surprises caused by confusing products, processes, policies, messages, or the environment that your customer is faced with. All of those are generally caused by shortcuts that we take in growth and innovation plans and execution. Um, there are a lot of reasons that we do that, um, but distrust is also a, a huge aspect of the opposite of piece of business. And that is really about how we go about acquiring and retaining our customers. Um, the, the whole customer acquisition addiction that we have, because we do lose customers, we're not necessarily... Uh, targeting our core growth uh, profile from uh, from the beginning, and we're faced with all kinds of quotas at the month end, quarter end, and we're bringing in customers that may not fit uh, the ideal, uh, uh, um, well, value proposition that, that we have and, and what uh, we can promise and what we can deliver. And so you have this continue, continual uh, churn problem uh, it's just a fact of life for every every group, every organization, but it could be reduced quite a bit. And any delays that uh, are, are unnatural in the sales cycle, 
customers requiring you to jump through extra hoops, uh, give greater incentives and so forth in order to, uh, to bring them on. These are um, manifestations of distrust to a great degree. And what is this all caused by? By and large, it's the data and metrics that we use that cause a short-term focus, an over-focus on investors and also on self-interest. And, you know, this, this is just the way that business has always been. It's the way that governments and uh, uh, non nonprofits often are also. But it doesn't have to stay that way. I think there are forces in play in the 2020s that can help us turn this around. And uh, in fact, we did a study that I'm going to tell you about in just a moment that really opened my eyes about some possible solutions. Another study that was done just uh, uh, published last month, the Edelman uh, Trust Barometer for 2022, shows that there are a large percentage of people who worry that journalists and reporters, government leaders and business leaders are purposely trying to mislead people by saying things they know are false or gross exaggerations. And when we think about business, this, these leaders are not just the CEOs, uh, the marketing, the, the PR, the, uh, the service, the, you know, the sales uh, people would also be, uh, I think, viewed as the, the spokespersons for the organization. And therefore, you know, we think we need to give a lot more scrutiny to how we're coming across and how we can reverse this trend. Because you can see compared to last year, it even increased seven to nine percent. So the Edelman Trust Barometer this year declared that there's a we're in a, a state of a cycle of distrust. And it's just uh, it's not getting better right now. It's time to step back and to make some changes in that. When you think about uh, your worries about the media and government, how, how much is caused by confusing growth and innovation uh, paths that they've taken. For example, uh, a lot of the cable news, they, they'll hype up certain things in order to get a certain level of viewers, right? So uh, it is really about confusing growth and innovation practices pressures in retention and acquisition and over-focus on the short-term self-interest and investors uh, as uh, leading causes of these uh, these trends that we're seeing. Glad to see you there, Mohammed. Uh, it's wonderful to, to uh, have representation from Egypt. And now, another part of the Edelman Trust Barometer study was that family-owned businesses are much more trusted than uh, privately held and publicly traded businesses, and then of course state-owned um, further down the the, uh, the line there. But can we really accept this as something that that we can be comfortable with going forward? This means that 33% to even 44% of people don't trust publicly uh, family-owned to publicly uh, traded businesses. 44%. That's too high. I think we need to relook at uh, how we are managing ease of business in our organizations. Are we just giving that over to customer experience management or just giving it over to digitalization? Uh, what kind of uh, effort really is needed? So that made me think about customer experience management and how, it, how we uh, have many aspects of that now voice of the customer, net promoter score, customer lifetime value, uh, monthly recurring revenue. Those are often uh, metrics that we talk about in customer experience management. Uh, to what degree are those helping us overcome this over-focus on the short-term self-interest in investors? In fact, what about the other financial ratios that are used? Net, uh, for, uh, what do you call earnings per share, uh, return on assets, uh, liquidity, uh, all of this. I, I'm not quite sure we're connecting the dots here on either end of the spectrum in overcoming this cycle of distrust. And then there's pressures in retention and acquisition. How well are, are, are social media management, customer lifecycle management, first contact resolution, customer service, customer success, customer relationship management? 
we're, I think we're probably uh, managing these too much as programs uh, rather than initiatives to uh, prevent uh, retention and acquisition headaches that are causing this distrust and uh, lack of ease of business. Again, uh, all the people on the call, if you would like to uh, say where you're from, it's really interesting to know where our participants are from. And also, what, what's an example that you uh, are thinking about as ease of business, good or bad? Um, for growth and innovation, we have digitalization, we have uh, digital experience and user experience, customer data platforms, also, of course, customer success, uh, CRM, many of these VOC, they uh, contribute to our growth and innovation plans and execution and, and uh, monitoring. Um, but I think we're falling short in traditional customer experience management and even traditional business management for solving these uh, ease of business issues. Remember that it's all about that gap between realities and expectations and being able to close that in fact, to minimize the gap from the, from the beginning, to be anticipatory and to prevent problems from happening, prevent the gap. So it really is a team sport beyond the customer experience team or the digitalization team or the customer service and customer success teams. We need to take the insights that we have about what employees, partners, and customers are telling us and parlay that into uh, the rest of the organization. This made me think of uh, baseball and the movie Moneyball. Do you remember that movie with Brad Pitt? A uh, baseball team has all vital players, the pitcher, the catcher, the first, second, third baseman, the outfielders, the shortstop. And then, of course, there's the, the umpire, the, the coaches, the the line, uh, what do you call them? The line, the, the coaches for the first base and third base, the runners on the opposing team. Um, and then you have the bat boy or girl. You've got the general manager. Um, you've got talent scouts. You've got all kinds of people in the back office, marketing, IT, you know, the finance, the whole, the whole team. What we learned in that movie, Moneyball, was that the success of the team isn't just about the, the people at the front line. In fact, their talent and, and um, their record is, is sometimes hamstrung, can largely be hamstrung by what's going on in the back office, how they're um, measuring things, how they go about uh, filling out the team and uh, all the management of it. So I think that's a really good analogy for what's needed in ease of business. Ease of business meaning that that's customer experience excellence. It's not just these programs. It's the matter of taking the intelligence from them and bringing that into the rest of the team so that uh, we have a prevention of the gap. So I see a comment here from David Schneer. It's been a long time, David, so I'm glad to see you. So uh, he, he says, I agree with you, especially about NPS, relatively useless. <laughs> All right. Uh, interesting. Uh, yeah, I think Net Promoter Score has its place, but it's, it's definitely overused. And there are many aspects of it that we need to be cognizant of as certain limitations. And, you know, who's the real right audience for it? And what, what do we need to be looking at in addition? The whole idea of having one metric um, is crazy. I would really ask, uh, I, I would ask the CEO, what one metric are you going to be sharing with the investors on your analyst calls this, this quarter and tell them, you know, we only can focus on one metric earnings per share. Don't be asking me about anything else. That's just crazy. So, uh, interesting. Keep them coming. We're really in interested in seeing more comments. Well, I mentioned that we did a study ourselves here at Clear Action Continuum. We asked executives, what seems to make the difference in years where your, uh, per, your organization's performance was awesome versus the years when it was mediocre? And we were talking to marketing executives for this study, but it was really eye-opening about the, this whole ease of business and ease of work, uh, these topics I've been talking about last week and this week. 
Uh, and we found that in the, in the people's comments, there were three overall patterns about ease of business. And one is a lifetime value mindset to combat the, uh, the distrust that's caused by pressures in retention and, and acquisition. Well, customer lifetime value mindset is a customer-centered way for getting and keeping customers. And uh, I'm not just talking about the actual aspect of loyalty programs and uh, acquisition programs, but all the things you're doing across your business, the whole ecosystem for attracting, onboarding, and, and uh, endearing your, your whole organization to customers so that they stay with you of their own accord. Um, so this is a key to ease of business. And what it requires is nurturing a relationship focus uh, every time that we're talking about acquiring and, and uh, keeping customers, but also it just in the way that we run the business. To what degree are we uh, eroding the relationship focus in the certain ways that we're talking about things, the way that we have organized our meeting agendas, the way that we uh, do our metrics? To what degree are we strengthening or eroding the relationship focus that's necessary for a customer lifetime value mindset? A lifetime value mindset also applies to employees and partners. The longer that we can have them um, pro productive with our brand, customers, partners, and employees, the greater value that, that's possible. Um, and then there's this idea of core growth customers. Core growth is nothing new, but it's something that we don't really focus on in customer experience management, except for maybe uh, uh, your forecasting and uh, CRM. But core growth means which customers are growing the most in their purchases this, this next quarter, this next year, the next two years. Those are the ones that are going to be driving your growth the most. And of course, there's all the other customers that may be flat or uh, declining their, their purchases for whatever uh, forces are on their, their uh, household or business. Um, but the ones that are growing are the ones that you need to be hitting the nail on the head with your performance. You need to really be tight in minimizing that gap between uh, expectations and, and uh, realities for that group. And we can do a lot better job uh, in all the aspects of customer experience management of really zeroing in on that group with a relationship focus and prevention uh, mindset. Uh, David had another comment about net promoter score. I'll show here uh, using it to measure performances is like putting a finger in the air to check the weather. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I like that because in my classes I teach that uh, all of the metrics that we're using for uh, market share, um, revenue growth, profitability, net promoter score, customer effort score, uh, first contact resolution, all of those are where the, the train has left the station. Um, this is talked about in my uh, CX, EX, PX, uh, ROI, uh, LinkedIn Live two or three weeks ago. And uh, what I was describing is that when you're measuring, when you're focusing on metrics that where the train has left the station, it's out of your hands, you can only know that performance after the, the public knows it or customers know it, they're just telling you about it. Um, it it's a, a dubious way to manage the business <laughs> because you're not, you're not uh, focusing on the things that lead to that, for that, uh, that need for contact resolution, the need for, uh, uh, for, uh, you know, customer effort, the need for uh, uh, market share and so forth. You need to be looking at your early warning signals inside your business processes that are tied to those issues that the customers are uh, re reacting to. And that's how you get proactive. So re revisit that uh, LinkedIn Live from a couple of weeks ago or message me and I'll send you a link. All right, so uh, the first thing that we found in our study was uh, that lifetime value mindset. The second thing was customer-centered action. And this is um, 
an antidote to the over focus on the short term self interest and investors. It's really about using metrics and data in ways that will motivate uh, largely in the th things that I've been talking about, about with David Schneer. Um, every time that you are conveying information to managers, whether it's survey results or whatever, uh, for example, um, I met with a guy who was head of customer service in the largest company in his country. And every Friday he would present um, the customer service dispositioning reports to the C-suite. And I, I said, what did you present last week? What did you present the week before? And the slides were almost the same. I said, well, why are they asking to see the same thing that they already saw? Uh, how come nobody's taking action on it? And I suggested to at least put some numbers, some money on that, the, each, each figure there in terms of how much it was costing the company, how much it was costing just the customer service team or just uh, you know, the tip of the iceberg. It doesn't have to be a full amount. It just needs to be a tip of the iceberg money figure of how much those customers represent in revenue or how much they're, uh, represent that issue is representing in costs. Um, because that's where you're going to stimulate people. What's in it for me as an engineer? What's in it for me as a, a person in legal or accounts receivable um, or wherever in the organization? Whenever we're giving reports, there is a way to con convey a sense of urgency to do something about that data. And this is what we mean by customer-centered action. We should be managing smarter tomorrow compared to last week because of the intelligence that we're bringing into our, our awareness um, we're collecting information from customers. And that this should permeate our policies and our processes. It shouldn't just be uh, you know, things that the touch points do differently. Going back to the Moneyball uh, movie example, we really need to influence the whole team and get the whole team unified in uh, preventing issues for customers. Now, the third thing that we found in our study about ease of business was enterprise use of insights. Influencing the way that we uh, develop our products and, and roll those out, our processes, our policies, our messages, our environments, it's really the whole the whole uh, ball there. So agile thinking and doing, meaning checking in with customers frequently as we create things, uh, is really important. And we've had a huge opportunity that I think most companies have missed during the pandemic as we've reorganized processes and policies uh, for work from working remotely or serving customers remotely. Uh, all kinds of things being in flux. It's a huge opportunity to be tapping into customer intelligence to guide the shaping of, of these um, modified policies and processes and products and stuff. And another part of customer-centered growth and innovation is to, to allow no waivers, meaning that no part of our ecosystem is exempt from being guided from by customer intelligence. No policy, no process, no uh, um, decision criteria should be exempt from customer intelligence as a potential influencer. Even uh, purchase requisitions uh, in internal classes can have uh, customer criteria or customer examples tied into them. These are what I call business rituals. So there are a lot of things that we found in the research we did. And all of that I call ease of business, ease of work, leading to sustained organic growth, meaning that you're preventing unnecessary worry, hassles, uh, costs, and um, you're you're therefore more profitable because you're preventing the unnecessary. You're also rechanneling um, a funding that was forever dedicated to remedial things when you prevent those remedial things from happening any further, then all of that funding, the budget is available for other higher value opportunities. 
And furthermore, as you take the, the pebble out of customer's shoe, they're more free to do more things in their business or their life and therefore to, to buy more, to spread more, more uh, positive word of mouth. And uh, this is what we mean by sustained organic growth. It is a team sport. So along those lines, I just want to give you a few resources to uh, dig further if this is a topic that's piqued your interest. Um, I've written an article just a week or two ago, customerthink.com slash author slash clear action, uh, giving eight detailed uh, recommendations for how we can turn around trust for employee and customer and partner experience. Uh, I think the best recommendation, the resource that I can share with you is this experience value exchange. It's an online uh, skill building community for your CX, CS, EX, and marketing teams to learn about these ease of business and ease of work uh, dynamics and earn badges as you uh, build skills and competencies in these areas of accountability, alignment, and agility to influence the whole organization as a, as a well-oiled machine, a, a great team. These are just some examples from a newsletter about the, uh, to the value exchange members, where we're talking about um, various contributions and ease of business and ease of work. So you can see that uh, members and other uh, experts supply a lot of uh, templates, uh, articles, podcasts, events, um, presentations, answers, questions. It's a, a dynamic uh, environment that you probably want to tap into many times during your week, just like any other resource or social media. Uh, further, we have free playbooks and FAQs on employee, partner, customer, and marketing, and uh, many courses that you can take. In fact, I'm teaching a course uh, in about a half hour from now, the expert class, CXEX and PX Leadership for Experts, where we not only talk about uh, the traditional competencies, but uh, going further on ease of work and ease of business is built into these courses, all of them. So welcome you to uh, take advantage of all these resources and just wanted to leave with you that experience leadership is the term that I coined in June of last year to represent stepping up further from experience management as we know it, where experience leadership is company-wide alignment to customers' expectations, not only customers, but employees and partners as well, because those are the three parties that fuel an organization's growth. So thank you for joining me today and best wishes to you in driving ease of business. Your, your comments are continually welcome uh, Lynn.hunsaker at clearaction.com. See you next time.